how you go into something is critically important. We've witnessed this with the shock and disappointment of watching people callously handle these all too critical days of this fight with coronavirus. To see beaches overcrowded with unmasked crowds throwing science and countless deaths to the wind and deciding that all that matters is what matters to them. Not just beaches, but bars and buildings filled with people who live with the easy dismissal with which we went into this portion of our lived history when the threat of this virus was downplayed and politicized and made comedic fodder. How we went into this pandemic defines really why we are responding to it now the way that we are. How you go into something is important. But equally important is how you go through something, the coping mechanisms, the lessons learned or ignored, the things or people used to make the pain easier to bear, the habits that are formed, the places the mind can take one to to help them to survive the presence of or absence of people and the level of support they do or do not offer. These are all extremely important to pay attention to as you go through something because they will clearly define perspective and opinion. They will defend or at least define certain behavior. They will provide a path backwards when it's important to go back in order to ask the questions that often scare us the most. What happened? What should I have discerned or paid more attention to? How you go into something is important. How you go through something is important. But how you come out of something is important as well. I have witnessed many people survive things that inspire, but they emerge worse as a person. Personality diminished, attitude soured, excitement dissipated, energy depleted. This to me is why the resurrection account left to us by the disciples of our Lord is so important. It was a matter of public record how Jesus walked into trouble that resulted in his execution. He got in trouble because he proclaimed a dangerous gospel that threatened imperial power and strength. He called into question a deeply oppressive system. He disclosed spiritual meaning that frightened those who had secured a strong foothold dominance on the temple and its partnership with government. It's a matter of historical and biblical record how Jesus walked into trouble. It is also easy to understand how Jesus walked through it. It was a path begun in a stable and ending on a skull-shaped hill. In between, his mission danced between Jew and Gentile territories and amidst those varied populations, preaching, teaching, ministering, listening, to common people whose scripture teachers heard him gladly. Rejected in towns and misdefined by closed-minded people, judged and criticized by those who felt threatened by his power and the sharing of his wisdom. He made every crowd gathering a competition for spiritual legitimacy, every miracle Jesus performed was judged against the law which prevented any of them merely from celebrating that a man sees for the first time or walks for the first time or hears for the first time, but instead, many wanted to simply argue about on what day did the man see? What day did the man hear? On what day did the man walk? And it all reaches its summation, does it not, on a hill outside of the holy city where between two thieves, Jesus is executed on the cross. Without Easter, we more than likely wouldn't know much about Jesus if his story had ended simply with what he walked into and what he 
went through, if it ended with crucifixion, he most likely would have been forgotten to history. Just another Jew crucified by the Roman Empire in a bloody century that witnessed thousands of such executions. Maybe a trace or two of his story would have been shared by historians of a failed resistance movement, but what defines the power of God, what makes us pay serious attention to the grace he extends to pull us into the wonder of redemption is that Jesus didn't just walk into, Jesus didn't just go through crucifixion, but Jesus emerged again in resurrected power and might. Mary stands outside the tomb early on that first day morning when, while she is sobbing, she kneels in to look into the tomb almost like maybe she missed Jesus' body laying in there. And when she kneels and peeks in again, she sees two angels seated there, both dressed in white, one situated where Jesus' head would have been, the other where Jesus' feet would have been. And when Mary peeks in, these angels say to her, why are you weeping? And her words give you a clear glimpse as to what she's thinking, because they've taken away my master, and I don't know where they have laid him. And it's when she turns away that her next sighting is of Jesus standing there. And in her pain, in her frustration, in her worry, in her grief, in her mourning, she doesn't even recognize him, mistaking him to be a simple gardener. Woman, why do you weep, Jesus says to her. Who, who are you looking for? She says, if you, sir, have taken away Jesus' body, just simply tell me where you've laid him, and I'll take his body from you. And Jesus, with the voice that only his sheep can understand, having heard the voice of the shepherd enough to only be fixed on it and it alone, Jesus says, Mary. And she heard it. From that place of spiritual connection, her spiritual sensibilities kick into gear. It was that connection made of the heart and spirit and not just the mind. She turns and she knows it's him, teacher. And when she goes to embrace him, he says to her, no, no, don't cling to me. I haven't ascended yet to the Father, but go and tell my brothers that I'm moving upstairs and mission will now be conducted from there. And Mary Magdalene wastes no time. She makes her departure. She runs and finds the disciples and she declares to them the good news of resurrection. It's important how you go into something. It's critically important how you go through something. But can I tell us this weekend, it's also important how you emerge from something. And if it is true that all we would have had is the record of his crucifixion, that in fact he might have faded away in history as just another of those countless souls executed by the brutality of Roman imperialism, then it's not the crucifixion that brings power to resurrection. It's the fact that Jesus emerged from death that makes us stand up and pay attention. Jesus emerged from that experience to offer us a lived experience that holds promise for us, not just with the conviction and beliefs that we need to go into some things that are dark and painful and confusing and threatening. Jesus emerges from that experience because it holds promise for us, not just with the faith and trust that we need to go through confusing and perplexing times, but with the spiritual conviction and spiritual certainty that while you got to go into some things, while you're going to be forced to go through some things. The promise of resurrection is that you have power to emerge from life-altering experiences in power and with God's purpose, clothing our path from there. Jesus, Jesus emerges from death to teach us that we too have the power to emerge from our life draining experiences that take what feels like the very life out of us. This is what resurrection is all about. 
And Jesus' ministry was about sacrifice and ministry and crucifixion was about sin and redemption. Burial was about death and seeming defeat. But resurrection is about emerging to new possibilities and accepting growth and implementing new discoveries. It's a chance to do things not just again, but to do them better, to allow scars to make contributions, to let our hurts and discoveries give us depth of wisdom and knowledge. It's a chance to learn that you can smile through your tears and exercise ministry with a limb and live convicted that God's strength is made perfect in my weakness and his grace is still sufficient. After Trump and COVID and school closings and far too many deaths and insurrection and police killings and ethnic violence and political divide and the personal cost of quarantining and social distancing and separation from family and what feels like the loss of an entire year. We hear the statistics of what we've walked into. We wear the masks and keep our distance and elbow bump rather than hug as actions that define how we are attempting to walk through. But the power of self Celebrating the resurrection this year is not in the lessons needed before walking into pain and suffering, not the courage needed to walk through hard times and storms, but the power graced to our lives to emerge from this in power and with grace and with growth and matured and learned and convicted and more resolute and more determined and deeply spiritual and faith fortified and prayers anchored. It's the power not just to go through, but to come out on the other side better and focused and sharpened. Every, every single experience you have had has been met with the Holy Spirit's empowering work inside of you to walk into it with enough grace to walk through it. And Mary seeing the resurrected Lord on the first day morning is the gift of grace to your life to teach you that the Lord has also given you enough power to emerge from whatever in strength. That's the message of the resurrection, not will I emerge. The answer to that is not a hard one. The more difficult question to ask yourself this year is how will I emerge? And this text is teaching us that the power to emerge is the gift on the other side of facing and fighting the necessary battles in life. Ne necessary battles. There are many battles we have that could have been avoided. We did not have to shake hands with them, but some battles are necessary. Jesus' resurrection is about victory over death, and it's about redemption and salvation. It's about atonement and acceptance by the Father. It is denoting the ransom paid, sin's debt covered. Resurrection is about access and the privilege to belong. All of that is attached to resurrection, but you know what else is attached to resurrection? It is the facing and fighting of that battle that takes something from us.